All right, so I will go ahead and get us introduced. Um, I am talking to my dear friend Oz. We are both uh, creators in the, and artists in the loose interpretation. Um, Oz is a writer. Uh, I think he has written on various uh, news outlets and has also published a book. He works in education and in tech. Um, and we have known each other for around 15 years. Um, we met growing up in South Carolina. Um, I have since gone to South America where I have become a content creator and I was given Colombian nationality due to my work in Colombia, which is still one of the coolest things that I've had happen to me. Uh, Oz is also, if I'm not mistaken, um, bicultural in the sense that he um, is very familiar with uh, the. I think I think you're from your 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 parents are from Sudan, right? Right. Yeah, Sudan. All right. So um, I hope that everyone's watching this is watching the video because we are opening up a very. Um, a very intriguing topic and a very a topic that causes a lot of angst and uh, self-righteous people to become upset. Uh, a, a topic that has canceled many people, like in the sense of their careers. A topic that is really um, that many people are scared of discussing, and a topic that you know very rightfully so needs to be respected. But we're going to be talking about um, like race in general the broad broad sense of the word but also we're going to talk about a couple of things that have happened recently that um as far as i'm concerned are uh worth discussing so um Oz, is there a subject that you want to get started off with yeah um let's let's talk about joe rogan since uh that's what everybody's talking about right now um and then we can talk about uh, what's going on when it comes to culture and race in America um, and how we're going to move forward, basically. All right. I think that's a, um, uh, I think, I think just saying moving forward is a good starting place. <laughs> I think um, that's a, that's a subject I'm intrigued by. And I, you know, full disclosure here, I am hesitant to, um, or not hesitant, but I, it's a subject that I really, um, I, I think that, you know, deserves the utmost respect. And I also want to recognize before, you know, going too far down that I, um, I'm definitely in this, uh, privileged, um, I, I'm very privileged in terms of being, you know, a, a white male and I recognize that and I, uh, um, I don't necessarily feel guilty because of it, but I do recognize that I come from a very good position. And so everything that I say, I, I want to uh, preface it by, you know, there's probably some things that I don't know and that I could learn that would be good for me. And I, part of me joining in on this conversation is um, wanting to be a bit educated. So um, that's, uh, and also really wanting to avoid any, anyone that, <laughs> Or wanting to uh, avoid offending anyone, I guess. <laughs> so that's uh, that's where I'm coming from. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, like you said, it's um, it's very nervous, I think, for people to talk about race um, in in this climate that we're in, uh, because obviously our personal identities have a lot to do with it. Um, we all have blind spots and things that we don't know. Um, we, you know, we don't have PhDs in race relations or anything. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, um, instead of canceling us, just uh, drop whatever feedback you have for us in the comments so that we can actually uh, grow um, and get smarter. Um, so I second that. I second that sentiment. And um, so, uh, well, all right. So just in case anyone uh, hasn't noticed, uh, so Oz, how you do you? Is there a term that you prefer when people talk to you, uh, a person of color or an African American or a Sudanese American? Is there anything in particular that you like to be referred to as? Interesting. Um, I've actually haven't spent too much time thinking about that. Um, I think I've been very comfortable with uh, black, um, African American, Sudanese American, uh, brown, minority. Um, I think uh, I've gotten used to all of these terms, um, and I think they exp 
playing part of a big part of my identity. Um, <laughs> are you are you asking me if uh, I'm okay with people calling me the N word, Zach? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, I um, I well, I just wanna I wanna make sure that we're um, uh, we define our terms and that uh, you know, Oz, it would be really really a shame if you know. Uh, you were to cancel me during this podcast, you know, like that would just ruin it for us, you know. <laughs> hey, this this might be the second and last episode, and it might end it might end early because of stuff that I say or you say. You, people at home might be watching um, a friendship, a biracial friendship, resolve live. <laughs> well, um, I like to think that um, our friendship is. Uh, is defined by mutual respect, and um, I think I think we should be able to, be able to avoid anything that would possibly get in the way of that. But um, I do well. I do want to know what your perspective about. Um, so essentially, I'll summarize Joe Rogan. What Joe Rogan did. There were two things that he did, and I want to hear what your thoughts are on both of them, and then I'll let you know what I think about it. But um, I think that it'd be more interesting to hear yours. So the first thing he did was he said the N word on like multiple podcasts and so they made a compilation of him saying the n-word and so according to what i understood and according to what he said um that was him saying the n-word when he was quoting people so um a, is that a cancel cancelable offense or i guess that i don't even want to know if that's cancelable or not because you can cancel anything now um for anything i feel like that that ter- term has taken has become way too powerful, uh, or you know, the whole idea of that's too powerful. But is that offensive? I guess if you were to see, like, and so one is like, if you were to see it and it was taken out of context, would you be offended? Because I understand that that video was actually taken out of context. Not saying that he's innocent there, but I am saying that like it was taken out of context to make him look particularly bad. He said that he felt really bad watching it. That he like he felt. He was ashamed of it, and he didn't feel like he had done anything wrong. So, out of context, is that is that offensive to you? And within the context that he said that he was using it, would that be offensive to you? I think that there's probably ways that it can be avoided. Like I've heard other uh, hosts of different programs, um, and you know these are white folks, um, and they they'll say you know they'll change it to Negro. Uh, or there's, they'll say yeah. the N-word. So I, I do think that there's ways of avoiding it and there's ways of playing it safe. Um, and honestly, I haven't seen that clip. And I've seen uh, you know a, a handful of Joe Rogan episodes. Um, I, I like his show. Um, but, and I've, but I've never actually seen a show where he uh, dropped the N-word. But I do know that it's very easy to avoid saying the N-word uh, when you are a host of a program. Um, or you can maybe say uh, Negro or whatever. Um, so, um, or, yeah, a lot of people are going to be offended by that because even no matter what the context is, uh, it's just not like all that necessary uh, when you're getting your point across. And I think he said um, in the um, apology video that he put out uh, where, where he came off actually very... Uh, self-aware and, and came off very genuine and that's the way he comes off in his show um he just seems like an extremely uh charismatic uh sincere um deeply curious person and i think that's why a lot of us are drawn uh to his podcast i mean this was joe rogan's podcast was the most listened to podcast on spotify in 2021 um so i think he um i think he probably wishes he didn't say that um yeah so i mean you know people are like oh how come i can't use this word it's like constantly being used in hip-hop and you know hip-hop like just got created like 50 years ago um this word has been around for uh, hundreds of years and it's got a very uh nasty terrible history um and so i think if you're aware of that you're kind of like Maybe I should just play it safe and not really say it. Yeah. Well, Oz, did you see the... um, There's a clip on YouTube that I think summarizes it perfectly where there's a white news anchor and he's speaking with a black news anchor and the white news anchor says, well, um, how come... uh, 
how come uh, African Americans can use the N word and white people can't? And then the the black news anchor is like, well, why don't you just say it? <laughs> and and he obviously doesn't, you know, like he. He, he's like, well, no, I'm not saying I want to say it, but it's like, well, why don't you? Why don't you? And I've always thought that that was like one of the most insightful clips of like, you know, uh, that that kind of summarizes the the issue. It's like, you know, I guess the question is, if you could ever use that word, like, I think that that is kind of where, like, if you would ever feel comfortable using that word, um, you're probably like you probably uh, have some very uh, disturb. Like, I think as a white person, I, I, I can't really take seriously or, like, respect anyone that is white that uses that word and, like, even contemplates, like, why can't you use it? It's just, like, some things that just don't have anything to do. Like, that, the way that I see it as a white, white guy is, like, you know, there's... There's absolutely no need for it. It doesn't benefit, and like it, it, more than likely, it's harmful. Um, you should probably just accept that that's something that you can't say and you shouldn't say, and that if you ever do say it, then you will definitely suffer the consequences. You know, and so, um, and I, I think that's fine. I think that, like me personally, I think that that's the way it should be. I, don't, I, I think that we should, you know, there, there's a certain amount of respect that we should be trying to communicate and give back to uh, you know uh that com the community that uses that word and one of the ways that we can respect it is say hey have your way with this word and do what you want with it it's your decision but it's not it's not our word to use i don't know i think what you say about consequences is like very legit um i'm all for like freedom of speech and everything and um i'm against some parts of cancel culture um but what people need to realize is that you know, you can say whatever you want. Uh, however, just be prepared to, like, deal with the consequences that follow. Um, I think we're, you know, this is like a conversation, part of this conversation is interesting. It's about language um, and how we use language. There's a lot of words that I, I don't use. Um, and there's a lot of words that I think a lot of people don't use. Um, and, you know, what's interesting is, like, in the last five or ten years, I have, um, and, I, you know, I definitely don't speak for, um, all black people and that's what's so crazy about these race conversations is that um, there's going to be you know there's like there's, if there's 50 million or whatever uh, black people in America there's probably 50 million different opinions on this um, but in the last 5-10 years I've noticed that I've got a big chunk of black friends that actually don't use the n-word anymore either um, and I got a bunch that still use it as well um, so, um, but what, what, if you're trying to get a point across and you've got a message that you're trying to get across and you use that word, um, I think most likely your message is going to be better received if you don't use it, uh, or you use something different instead. Um, so even if you're quoting someone else, like it's not really necessary for you to use it. Um, but, but Joe did that and, um, he's facing some consequences however i think a lot of people um are looking at spotify and they're saying hey you know you guys are the media company um and you guys are the ones who uh gave joe this platform and you guys are paying him maybe you guys should do a better job of um editing how he speaks um not necessarily censoring him i don't think it's censoring him if you um tell him that he, he can't use the n-word um but you know i think spotify has some responsibility here as a publisher and as a media company to be like hey um we're okay with you doing this we prefer you not to use the n-word and we're gonna do some fact checking here the same way like fox news uh you know they've got probably a lot of complaints about Tucker Carlson um, and so and they get a lot of heat for that and so I think I think Spotify uh, I think some people feel like the issue is really more with Spotify than Joe Rogan and I honestly I don't know Joe so I, there's no way for me to say if this dude is racist or not um, well did okay so I, well, when I heard his apology, like, one half of that, like, sounded great to me. Um, and then the other half, so, they, so 
I think it was uh, Nadia. I, I forget her name. She's a she's a singer. Um, Indy India Ari. I think that's how she, her name is uh, pronounced. Um, yeah. She posted it on her stories, and so I saw the compilation. And so, like, yeah, it was really uncomfortable. And like, I think that he had every reason to apologize, and he did a good job apologizing for that thing. Now, however, um, well, that that, and this is the thing about cancel culture. Like, what was permitted in two thousand five, and like you know, accepted is definitely not anymore. And it's like it's almost like should you hold people that were famous for this long to higher standards, like? Um, like Thomas Jefferson, you know, like should should he be canceled now because you know he lived like two hundred years ago and, and two hundred years ago, you know, he he did a bo- uh, you know uh, uh, like horrible, unacceptable things that were accepted at that time. So, like the question is, if you are not like a savant in the sense that like you're able to, you know, like I guess. Um, the it's so crazy because abolition the the people who wanted to abolish uh, slavery I'm having a hard time pronounce that abolitionists I think um, were considered extreme 200 years ago where now it's like they were just decent human beings you know like like that's they they were doing the very least they could do they probably weren't even doing enough you know so I guess sh- how hard should we you know uh, throw down the hammer on people that were conforming with the language and the concepts of their time because after that joe reagan talked about how he was trying to see a movie called the planet of the apes and they were like trying to go into uh find find a theater where it was playing at and they found an inner city theater and he said that going into the theater he felt like he had uh entered into the planet of the apes and like that to me just sounded like like 1960s like that doesn't even sound like 2005 like i don't know like and he said that and it was recorded and like at that point it put me to i i doubted everything that he had said about using the n-word because like that kind of humor i just don't i mean i you know i hate to throw the guy under the bus and say he's just like bad but like i don't know where in what context like that humor would ever be like acceptable or like you know permissible. I, I don't know. Like, w- did you hear about that second part of his um uh, of that video that they made of him? Nah, um, I didn't really know all about that. Um, but I heard something about Planet of the Apes. Um, you know, it's like all right, we hear a lot of racist jokes in comedy clubs. Like, I love going to comedy clubs, and I hear a lot of racist jokes on stage. Um, but you know, that's a setting where, uh, for a long time, we, uh, we know we're going to hear some very wild, outlandish, uh, bizarre stuff, uh, that could be racist. Um, I think it's very interesting. I mean, is there, I think there's going to be people that are making jokes, um, that are in poor taste. Um, like I don't, if that is a joke, um, I don't know. I don't, to me, I can't really see, like, um, what makes it really funny. Um, that's a, t- that's a tough one for me to understand. Um, like, where in the standards that we set, I mean, honestly, I'm more concerned about the misinformation that Joe may have put out related to, uh, vaccines versus, uh, what type of jokes and um, how he's using the n-word it, you know even though that's really important as well uh, however yeah. his use of the n-word isn't going to lead to people um, maybe dying from covid and i'm not saying everything he said about vaccines is misinformation but obviously um, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of people saying like hey he did put out some misinformation about uh, vaccines and the efficacy of vaccines. And Spotify, after this story broke out, Spotify went and I think removed about 20,000 um, podcast episodes. And I think those were episodes related to um, misinformation around uh, the pandemic and the efficacy of vaccines. Um, so I think. I'm not sure, but I think we're entering a stage where, like, if we're dealing with pandemics and stuff like that, there's got to be another level of fact-checking um, that we're kind of accustomed to. Um, you know, I don't know if um, where the threshold for removal exactly is for Spotify. 
Um, but his Joe's apology did sound um, fair. Um, you know, he, he did come off as he did seem very genuine and sincere. Um, but you know, I'm not I'm not for censoring Joe because I think uh, this is an example of where like the dissenter's voice is really important. Um, and I think a chunk of this is also connected to capitalism because in this country we you know we vote with um, our time and our talent and our money uh, around company around companies that match um, our values. So I think that there is going to be like um, Neil Young, I think that's his name, who like removed his music. Um, so I think like hey, if people have an issue with uh, someone that is a host of a program like that, they're going to look at the parent company and they're going to be like, oh, okay, cool, since you guys don't want to really uh, do anything about this, I'm just going to remove my music or I'm going to actually end my Spotify subscription and move move over to Apple or Tidal. Yeah, so um, that's a... Uh, so I guess... Which one do you think was more, so I think you may have touched on this, but I just want to confirm, which one do you think was more meriting of like a, a, a mass cancellation? The misinformation or the joke in bad, uh, or well, his, so it's like his prior jokes, like, okay, so all, keeping in mind with all that, like, I think that the thing about the Planet of the Apes was actually in a podcast that wasn't on Spotify or even published. I think it may have been like a YouTube clip or something from like 20 years ago. But then um, I guess the question is if somebody like Neil, I, I'm pretty sure Neil Young wanted to pull his music off a podcast because of the Joe Rogan's po uh, his vaccination stance, if I'm not mistaken. Is that is that can you confirm that for me? Um. Um, I, I think so as well. I'm not 100% sure, but I think it was related to that, that that misinformation around the vaccines. Yeah, so it's like Neil Young was not cool with the vaccine and India Ari was not cool with, you know, his his liberal use of the uh, N-word or his just use of the N-word. Um, I guess the question is uh, for, because for me, I feel like... Uh, I, I think that I may have like a, um, uh, you know, the white guy syndrome where I'm just like, I'm not as bothered by the vaccine as I am by like him, like, you know, using like the N word, which is, which is, you know, not even my battle to fight. But like, I guess, I guess my thing is like, um, what, what is, what is the reason that he was can't or wh which reason should we be fighting for, for him to be canceled? Um, and is it reflect poorly on Neil Young that he was bothered by the vaccination stance and not so much by the, um, uh, his, his, uh, potentially racist comments? <laughs> and here's the thing. I mean, I don't think, I don't think Joe should be canceled. Um, I, and I know that this is, this is a big story because he's got a very large platform. This is somebody who is extremely influential. Um, Joe is also, you know, there's, um, I don't know if it's a false sense of balance, but people say, hey, Joe is bringing on people to his show from who have many different views and who hold uh, many different perspectives and angles. And, um, and if you watch his show and you look at the data, you know, he is bringing a lot of people from the left and the right. Um, and he is giving um, space to have conversations about many different things, including conspiracy theories. Now, there's like some people that say um, he's not doing enough fact checking when it, when he's spending time talking to guests about conspiracy theories, and Spotify should do some more um, some richer fact checking around those conspiracy theories. Um, but I think when the situation gets serious is when you're putting out. Um, misinformation related to health um, and the efficacy of vaccines, information that is going to basically, uh, that could possibly put people's lives in danger um, or, you know, actually kill people. And many people did die. That's the thing. Many people did die from misinformation around the vaccines. And this is a whole, probably another conversation that we can have on another episode. But 
if you look at the data and you look at the people who uh, chose to get vaccinated and the people who decided to opt out, um, especially with like with Delta and Omicron, um, I think the science shows that more people who refuse to get the vaccines, I know there's a lot of variables involved here, uh, but more people who refuse to get the vaccine uh, died if they got COVID. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, okay, so, um, so in, from your, from your stance, um, let me see if I can summarize it. It, it was probably the, his most, uh, his most, um, a, not cancelable, but his most offensive, uh, like, act in, or his most offensive policy, or the one that was, like, most harmful was the 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 vaccination like his stance on vaccination that was the one that you could measure the harm that was done uh and that was the most severe out of his uh infractions that have recently come up yeah i think you know and, and everyone's entitled to their own opinion and if you um and i'm not sure if this was his philosophy but um i do think that if you live a healthy lifestyle, you exercise, you eat well, you eat clean, um, you know, you, you build up your immune system. I do think that um, you're better off dealing with COVID if you get it. But I do think that if you have this large of a platform and you're telling this many um, millions of people around the country that you're creating doubt around the efficacy of vaccines, it, um, I think that is a very dangerous thing, and I think that's something that Spotify uh, should have done a better job uh, with since they they gave him the deal. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that, you know, uh, a lot of times I've heard, I've listened to Joe Rogan, um, and I've, had, I've heard him, you know, just like bring out some really, really big bro science that it's essentially boils down to, well, like, yo, bro, I work out a lot and I eat meat, and uh, it's great for me, uh, so what's the issue here? You know, it's like, he, he tends to, um, uh, I think he has a very uh, self, um, self-centered self or an egocentric view of health in that he doesn't really have the ability to consider, like, all the, mold, like, the, the thousands of different uh, variables that affect every one of us and he kind of like goes from it like oh well look at me i did it and so yeah i think that that is probably something that spotify should i mean it's not it, you don't even need to like i don't know i guess he doesn't there's no need for like nobody was like hey joe tell us the secret you know he kind of like just yeah you know, i was like hey look at what i did you know it's like he, he like he like he he was putting himself under like an experiment and like hoping for the best and it worked out well for him but i don't think that that merits you know like him saying hey yeah this this was uh every everybody should do this or anything like that even though i i don't know if he said everyone should do this but he he definitely under or downplayed his influence i think in a way that could yeah definitely harm a lot of people that don't have such a uh you know such a strong immune system and when you say like he um, underplays his influence, I think that's really clutch here because um, Joe is using this uh, like narrative of like, hey, I'm not, I'm not a scientist. I'm not really a journalist um, as kind of like to create this um, space for him to have this freedom to, um, to skip some fact checking. Um, is it great that he had Sanjay Gupta on his show? Yeah, phenomenal. Um, you know, the stuff that he said about, um, I think it's called ivermectin, uh, that medicine, yeah. you know, that a lot of that stuff is very interesting. I've spoken to, like, some friends who are pharmacists uh, who some have said, like, nah, don't take that. Some have said, actually, that could help you if you get COVID. Honestly, I don't know the science behind ivermectin and how helpful that can be if you get COVID. However... Um, I think there's been reports uh, of people who took that ivermectin and they had some crazy side effects that they had to deal with uh, that sent them to the hospital as well. Yeah. Yeah, well, all right. So we'll, um, so we're going to summarize Joe Rogan and uh, I, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but let's just say Joe Rogan, um, 
should should uh, should watch what he's saying uh, on a lot of on a lot of levels. I think that um, he could probably. Well, here's the thing: like what he said in the past that was like you know race related. I think that like. Well, what's your stance on this? Like, uh, he said those things about the the race in the past. So, like, um, he said the things about the vaccine, like, six months ago. So, it's like, he, um, it's like his ability, his scope of, like, attention has been slightly, like, um, you, you would expect that over the time, uh, over the course of the years, he would be more careful about what he was saying. So, it appears like, Maybe he's more careful about the words he uses, but his overall sense of expression hasn't become like more cautious at all, apparently. And I mean, yeah, and I think part of that is like we're dealing with major big time influencers who are not journalists. And I mean, look at I mean, me and you, we're not we're not trained journalists either, but the thing is we're having these conversations, but that's what everybody's doing. You know, we don't have millions of people listening to us uh, yet, <laughs> but um, yeah. I, but I think what the story tells us, reminds us, is that, hey, uh, media companies are in an interesting new landscape, um, and any company that has shareholders um, who believe in the truth, then they've got an obligation to do some fact-checking and have a very, a more, um, and to avoid having a, dis, a distasteful response uh, to these sorts of um, situations. Um, you know, I, I, I watch Joe Rogan's show when, when Kanye or Elon Musk or uh, Sanjay Gupta, you know, a lot of these people that I'm, uh, I'm interested in seeing what they have to say, you know, I'm going to tune in. Um, but I don't really have... Um, a huge background in watching a lot of Joe's content. But before we leave this topic, though, Joe is a fighter in a in a he was a fighter and a stand up comedian as well, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, here's the thing. I think we need to. Everybody has has the ability to not listen to Joe's show. If you don't like what he's saying, you don't have to listen to it. Um, you know, you can you can take your music off of uh, Spotify. I don't even know if black people know who Neil Young is. I just found out who Neil, Neil Young is. Did you listen to Neil Young before this? Yeah, dude. I'm, I mean, you know, I, I'm pretty white like that. You know, I'm, I'm pretty vanilla. You know, Neil Young is like a synonym for vanilla, you know, like uh, the most vanilla artist out there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. I just found out who um, Neil, Neil Young is, and I'm pretty sure a lot of black people did as well. Um, but, you know, what's interesting about this is like, yo, we're in a country where everybody's like, yo, um, it's my body and I'm going to do what I want. Um, and it's just funny and ironic to me that a lot of those people are also the people who are um, against abortion. Okay, yeah. So, that, well, that is, that, is, um, that is a very big, um, you know, that... That's a huge topic, and I, I I'm not. I think we should have it on a different episode because that's just like that. That's so controversial that like unpacking that statement is like you know a good twenty minutes. But I I I do agree with you. For those that are wondering, yes, like um, it's my body. I will do what I want. I can. Well, yeah, I can. You know, do whatever I want in, in the event, like in the sense of like I will or I won't take a vaccine or I will like do ecstasy or cocaine on the weekends. Or I will get a tattoo or whatnot. You know, it's like, but yeah. And, and then any stance on abortion is very interesting. But I don't know. I think my, my stance on abortion is that I'm a man. And so I'm going to relieve myself of any obligation to discuss it because it never affects my own body. And I'm just all about women's rights and stuff. Oh, man, I think that's the smartest thing that we can say is basically we're not, we're not women. And we should probably listen to what women are saying about that instead. Um, and so, yeah. uh, you know, it's like, I know one of the themes throughout a lot of these conversations is cancel culture, of course. Uh, both, Zach, both of us are from South Carolina, and um, back in 2015, um, the dude uh, who shot up the church in Charleston, um, some people actually say he went to our high school for a year or two, um, and he was a couple of years ahead of us. So Zach and I, we don't know him. Um, and, and that's, um, uh, Dylan Roof, but 
what, what's interesting to me is that the Reverend Anthony Thompson in 2015, he said, um, I forgive you and my family forgives you. And this is after this guy shot up, killed nine people in that church in Charleston. And I thought it was just very extraordinary that somebody said, hey, I, I forgive you and so does my family. And um, I think forgiveness is a very interesting thing that we're not talking about in regards to cancel culture right now. Uh, but also, I'm not advocating um, that people should be more forgiving because I don't think someone can tell someone else, hey, this is how you should forgive someone or this is when you should forgive someone. So, wait, so, so you're, you're saying that people should... Uh... So do you agree with the pastor saying that, or are you saying that you don't agree with the pastor saying that? You know, I think everybody has to make up their mind about it. Here, here's, here's what I agree with. I agree that forgiveness is something that we need to start thinking about a little bit more in regards to cancel culture. Um, and I think unmerited forgiveness has a major uh, correlation with restorative justice. Um, and so... I think if we want, if we want to figure out how do we get through this whole cancel culture thing, it's all, it's about restorative justice, and I think we still got to seek accountability from people who do uh, wrong stuff. Uh, but it's about elevating the truth, and it's about understanding like um, punishment and vengeance, um, and also I think allowing. Uh, victims um, to act as forces of morality uh, by practicing um, acceptance and mercy. These are things that we're not really taught about in school. Like we're not taught about cancel culture or forgiveness. I and I think these are some things that like you might get from religion or studying philosophy and morality. Um, but if we, like you said, if we just start canceling everybody moving forward, I'm not really sure who's going to be left, and I'm not sure how do we respond once if someone does something wrong and they um, and they show us that they've learned from their mistake. Um, usually, the next step is to forgive them. However, um, I think we have a lot of issues there because if we're dealing with someone who kills nine people in a church, it's kind of like how do we forgive that? If, if this is someone who's delusional in trying to ignite a race war. Yeah, so um, my thoughts on that, and, you know, like, I will obviously take the liberty of, you know, taking my psychology background and, you know, um, analyzing the situation to do that. But I, I can imagine, I can imagine a scenario where, you know, the Reverend Anthony Thompson was just very much consumed by rage and you know possibly just like definitely frustration but also just like impotency and just like you know anger and just like you know uh just the feeling of like having you know i'm sure he was just like devastated by that event and you know i think that him saying that to me personally it's just one of the well like not well he didn't say that to me personally but him saying that to me personally uh, is just one of the greatest acts of like emotional intelligence and strength of our times because you know the thing about cancel culture which i think is a very um overlooked point is like these people that are trying to get people canceled and you know like god bless them you know like you know you gotta you got to let people like, you know, we need our social justice warriors just as much as we need everybody else in society. And hope that term isn't, you know, pejorative because that's not my intention of using it. But, you know, like when like these people that are very, very set and like, you know, very convinced of their necessity to, you know, um, cause these these cancellations. Um, I just wonder if they think about they th this all the emotional energy that they are in investing in in these scenarios and like the benefit of their their work you know their benefit of their you know like i guess you could call it their their activism or their their you know involvement uh, i guess you know when i hear this pastor it's like what's the least 
cance or what's the most cantable offense that we can come up with? Uh, probably killing somebody. You know, like that. Like that definitely. That definitely deserves a cancellation. I think that's you know just basic human rights, universally accepted. Uh, you should probably um, cancel people that kill people. Like you know, without a doubt. And it's it's so insane that this pastor, at least to me, that this pastor wasn't just caught up on like justice here. He just said, "I forgive you. My family forgives you." And I think that those words, you know, and like. I think that those words are just so spiritual and like so healing that like, you know, and this is one of the things that has always stuck with me and is one of the things that I think I would probably tattoo, but uh, I would tattoo myself with, which is not really relevant to the conversation. But when uh, Dr. Martin Luther King uh, said, you know, uh, hate doesn't cancel out hate or no, he said, well, like dark doesn't cancel out dark. Only light can do that. Uh, Hate doesn't cancel out hate. Um, only love can do that. And like that to me is just like completely missing in modern society. Like we, we don't have like compassion or empathy or forgiveness. And it's creating such a toxic like cancel culture that when you see somebody say, hey, I forgive you like that to me, like that gives me chill bumps just thinking about like his emotional intelligence, because like that is the last thing that should be forgiven. If you were to look at like, you know, Generation Z and their pursuit of, you know, uh, imposing their justice on, you know, everyone. Yeah, bro, I think, um, well, I think there's gonna be some Generation Z people in the comments saying, uh, not another white boy messing up an MLK quote. Um, But, but, yo, everything, a lot of the stuff you're saying is spot on. And I think it's like, yo, we're not used to hearing that. It's very unusual. We're not used to talking about that just yet. Um, you know, I, I didn't hear people from uh, the trans community saying, we forgive Dave Chappelle. Um, I'm not sure if people have started saying that yet. Um, but it does take the conversation to, I think, another level. Um, you know, what you say about the woke community and the social justice warriors, um, you know, like, there is a movement, like the, the Black Lives Matter uh, activists, for instance, you know, um, I think what they're teaching us is that, like, look, um, restorative justice doesn't really mean that people shouldn't be severely disciplined. And I agree with you. I think, like, um, if you are um, condoning violence or if you are killing people, yeah, you should you should be canceled for that. So if you're... If, any any sort of promotion of violence, yeah, to me, that's it's okay to cancel you totally. Um, you know, uh, you deserve it, um, and I think that is probably like, and you also deserve the full measure of punishment um, if you deserve it. Um, and so, you know, I think it's going to be hard for people in the country to forgive, um, for instance, uh, cops who are killing um, unarmed uh, black people without justification. Um, and I think the, if we're talking about moving forward and what's sustainable, um, like a sustainable model for social change, uh, then we got to focus on having, uh, the foresight, um, and the courage to basically revive this moral passion in our country for restorative justice. I think that is going to be the most sustainable model for social change. Um, And I also think it's very interesting what we're seeing right now uh, with Russia and Ukraine. Um, I think this this might be off topic, but what Putin is doing in Ukraine, um, he's definitely planting a lot of seeds of hate. And I don't know how, I don't know how long that that situation is going to go on for. But what I do know is that for generations, uh, there's going to be people in Ukraine uh, who hate Putin and develop so much hatred for Russia. And uh, that's just not what we want to do in our country. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I agree. It's, uh, you know, like, um, and and definitely my, my apologies for uh, butchering an MLK quote. I, I think, I, th- I like to think that I, 
that I may have uh, summarized it more or less, but I definitely, I definitely didn't say the proper words. So my apologies for that. I, I, I'm not afraid to apologize, <laughs> but uh, I, I do need forgiveness. No, I'm just kidding. But um, yeah, the uh, in in terms of it, well, that's an interesting concept that I hadn't really like. You know, uh, restorative justice. You know, that's. That's a um, that that I haven't really researched this subject. I look at like most of it on face value, and I'm sure a lot of people will say, "Ah, about time, about time you admitted that." But I, it's also like so. The concept behind restorative justice is um, when you like you do punish people. Like that that means like there it does involve punishment, right? Like there is a punishment involved. Yeah. So, but is 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 there forgiveness involved in that, like integrally in the in in that concept, or is that is that more of you know like would, would I guess restorative justice just seems it seems like a pretty big umbrella term, you know, like um, yeah. it it could mean it, it could mean a lot of things, and I guess like I'm I'm trying to familiar familiarize myself with it. Yeah, no, I think that is a brilliant question. Um, I'm not an expert. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm not an expert on restorative justice, but I think the goal is to basically um, restore broken relationships, uh, heal the breaches, uh, readdress these imbalances, um, rehabilitating uh, the victim and the perpetrator, um, and then giving people an opportunity to be reintegrated back into the community. Um, and it's not just about punishment. And I think if we're talking about cancel culture, you know, does it's like, all right, Dave Chappelle said some said some, uh, you know, some wild stuff throughout his stand up shows about um, many people. It's like, um, how do we how do we bring these people who say certain things that a lot of people disagree with? How do we bring them back into the community? Um, and it kind of like it kind of reminds me of the story of Amy Cooper and Chris Cooper, uh, the bird watcher in New York and the situation at Central Park. Um, you know, she was fired from her job and a lot of people said that she definitely needed to be fired from her job. Um, and there's other people that say, hey, um, maybe there's another form of restorative justice. What if, what if there was a different approach? And what if her employer demanded that um, she reads and studies more about race and um, uh, and if she sorry I was getting a phone call Zach but I think we're back um, so what if she reads more about black masculinity white privilege and social justice and these are things that nobody we we didn't learn about these things in growing up in K through 12 um, and depending on what you studied in college you know, you may have not have, you may not have um, learned about white privilege, social justice, lots of stuff related to race. What you just said about restorative justice is brilliant because I think uh, with Amy Cooper, you know, there's a lot of people who demanded that her job fires her. And there was like a wave. You remember that time where everybody was just like, yo, you need to get canceled. You need to get fired. And we thought like that was really beneficial for society. But there's a lot of people saying, hey, there might be a better approach here. Instead of just trying to fire everybody from their job, um, maybe uh, her employer should have demanded that she reads and studies more about race, black masculinity, white privilege, social justice. Um, you know, losing her job, um, you know, maybe that's an act of retributive, um, retributive justice. Um, but, and there's a lot of structural issues that we're probably about to get into, but I just don't know if that's the best approach is like just canceling people and just, uh, having them get fired from their job. Yeah. So that, yeah, that, that, that subject is so intriguing to me and it's like, Obviously, Amy Cooper is a well. I think I think I can use this term liberally, but um, she's an asshole. I think, <laughs> undoubtedly, she is just like a raging, um, uh, lacking of any empathy, and just also from all apparent um, 
you know, from everything that you could gather from that video, very privileged and self-righteous, you know? So like no one like by suggesting that she gets uh, uh, less of a penitence is suggesting that she is, you know, um, that she's not uh, like a bad person. I, I think that, or not a bad, well, I don't, I don't know her as a person, but she has some very toxic, negative and, you know, um, anti-community traits that is without a doubt um and also yeah she seemed very privileged and self-righteous and just like you know a very inflated ego and sense of self-worth now yeah so my question is does she deserve to lose her job because of like did they hire her based on her worth as a human is that what she contributed to the company or did, did she deserve to be fired for it i don't know man like i mean like, yeah, it's hard to watch that video for me because she just looks just, I mean, she just looks like a monster out there. I mean, like everything that she said is just like so off-putting and just like, like, is she really going to stoop that low? Does she deserve to lose her job? I don't know. I mean, my inclination is that, you know, I'm glad that she's not my employee because, you know, that would really, that would really be unfortunate because then I would have to make the decision and be confronted with you know the people that support me for firing her and then later on the people that said oh that was a very you know extreme measure what 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 do you feel about like what what's your uh you know uh just what what's your uh interpretation of the of justice on this particular event it definitely the story definitely shows us how people can use um their privilege um to destroy other people and that this is still happening and it's new york city i'm sure there's millions of conflicts on a daily basis um but there you know there's a kind of person who kind of takes those sorts of actions and calls the cops and says hey my life is in danger when your life isn't you know actually in danger um so that is a that is a very extreme wild uh violation and i think the story kind of raises questions like hey uh what what how what do we do if if someone's racist and they're willing to admit they're wrong and do the work um and i know that, that that's way so overused or whatever that means um but those are the sorts of things that can make our communities uh stronger um and so I think if if the pun punishment may feel uh, cathartic um, to those harmed by a wrong action, uh, but it may not actually achieve achieve real justice. Um, so the I think the bottom line or where we're trying to get like the moral intent of restoration is to create flour flourishing communities that acknowledge when wrong is done, hold the wrongdoers accountable, uh, but somehow maybe invite them back into the community um, from, you know, whatever actions kind of est estrange them. Um, you know, I think in the long run, uh, black activists uh, could actually gain an ally in the effort to combat racism. Um, if, if people are not forgiven for the errors that they make and they're not welcomed back, then if, if anything, uh, the burden on black people uh, is by that me measure uh, lessened. I if, we, if these people are actually forgiven and, and brought back into the community. The thing is though, reconciliation is a very difficult thing to pull off uh, because right now I think reconciliation is almost impossible because one side is kind of like hell bent on proving that the other side is wrong. So we kind of get stuck having this conversation like, um what should happen to this person what, what should their punishment be but and we you know one side says oh we should like we stand with um you know Coop, Ms. amy cooper and one side's like nah like uh she's wrong and we just kind of stay having a conversation about that disagreement and who's right and who's wrong uh but we're not really having many conversations about um how to deal with these sorts of individuals yeah, well, I, I tend to agree with you. And man, when you were talking about all this, like so, so many thoughts just like ran through my mind. Um, and it's like, yeah, shouldn't the goal here like and I feel like that's like a very big dialogue on the political state of things because we have gone through and I don't know how long it's been going on, but you can you can feel 
you can feel the polarization and the tendency to create this concept of us versus them. And it's like almost ingrained in like a lot of people's concept of uh, politics and justice and righteousness and even religion, you know? And so I think that that in, in part is like the problem that we are just so like us versus them that we don't ever look at like things like, hey, it could be, you know, uh, us and them, you know, like they, you know, like what if we just forgave this person and gave them the opportunity to learn from their experience. I'm sure that Amy Cooper, like, I mean, I'm not trying to like, she, she I mean, she, <laughs> she deserved it. She, she won it, you know, she like everything that came to her, she definitely got it. But, you know, I know, I know for a fact that nobody has thought about this as much as Amy Cooper, you know, like, I mean, that, that has been probably one of the defining moments of her life. And like, I bet, that she would be more than willing to contemplate everything that she said and, you know, possibly look at it in a different light. She was probably willing to say, hey, I really messed up there. Let me learn, you know? And I think that that, um, that and another thing that I heard and that I wanna, that I wanna brush by you really quick is um, the concept of like, it's so easy to, uh, you know, when you're not actually in the same room as someone, it's so easy to just vilify them and like make the, like, I feel like she just needs like diversity exposure. I, I feel like that'd be great for her because it's like, sometimes you need that in order to understand and in order to like grow as a person. And like, we live in a society where it's so easy for us to be in our, in our immediate circle and never interact with anyone that's ever different from us. And I think that most of the like intense, like violations of justice and like these like very very uh strong negative energy feelings come from people that have no experience interacting with diversity i don't i don't know like you know on the internet on facebook um what what do you think about that oh man i mean i think part of that is like the internet has given everybody a voice and a channel um to say whatever they want and the thing is uh that's really amazing and everything but not everybody needs to be heard and i'm pretty sure there's people listening to me and you and they're like these guys need to end this and they don't really need to be talking um but i think the response that people have is very interesting and um we'll see how i mean maybe we'll never really see anything from amy cooper again but uh, it reminds me of uh, a virginia governor ralph northam um I, maybe this was last year uh some photos came out of him doing blackface i think at a house party decades ago everyone said he needs to resign he did he did not resign um and but what happened was during the remaining years uh where he was in office he actually increased focus on racial justice um he started paying very close attention to uh, maternal mortality equity in transportation um he funded he sent more money to HBCUs. Um, he focused on how do we teach uh, the history of race in our schools? Um, you know, he took down, he helped take down the Robert E. Lee um, uh, statue in Richmond. Um, and he also restored the voting rights of uh, tens of thousands of felons. Um, and a big chunk of those felons were black. Um, so very crazy situation where everyone is like, yo, we got to get rid of this guy this governor for doing blackface. Uh, but the way he chose to respond was by not resigning and doing a lot of good for minorities. So I think it's a weird situation because you can't always predict how people re will respond or try to make up for the mistakes uh, that they did um, or how people are going to change. Uh, but everything that you're saying about um, us moving forward um, and d like a healthy democracy, uh, this is how we this is how we achieve it uh, by I think having these sorts of conversations um, right now you know we're in a climate where we're seeing uh, more uh, a surge of anti-semitic language anti-asian uh, Islamophobia uh, phobia uh, anti-black racism and all of these things they just threaten our social fabric um, and one of the problems is, we all went to school here and we basically never really learned that deeply about identity the relationship between identity history ancestry uh science dna 
Um, and so if we have a more nuanced understanding and ways of looking at individual origins, um, we will find a more unifying uh, narrative about our shared heritage. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's a, um, that's a, I actually wanted to ask you this from the beginning of the podcast, because I mean, this is a small, like, you know, um, we're, we're going off the, off the path a little bit, but I think it's very relative relevant to what we're talking about. And I, I think we're good on time because we had a little, uh, we should be good. And I really want to get this question out. There's two things. You and I grew up in the same, uh, region, which is just a very, you know, not very metro, metropolis metropolis region like we're we're pretty in our own little corner of the world in south carolina we are not exposed to a lot of diversity and so i wanted to comment with you because when i first met you like i don't know like i got along with you and it had nothing to do with like the color of our skin it's not like i was like oh man i really i really need a black friend it was like wow this dude is just like he just like seemed really well thought out and like well educated and like able to carry conversation with me in a way that a lot of people just don't uh, really like follow along with me. And, and that's not to say that I was really smart growing up. I was just saying uh, everybody that went to, oh wait, hold on. Let me, let me choose my words wisely. We weren't a really highly intellectual community that I moved around in, I guess. And it was kind of like, um, I sought out those kind of connections and Oz, you were really, uh, our friendship was very fulfilling due to our, uh, tendency to appreciate, you know, um, just, you know, all things that are based on, you know, the pursuit of knowledge. And so when you and I made friends, I just never really considered like our differences. I, I just like, they, they seem to be almost non-existent. Um, and I know that that's probably not the case. But, um, like, I guess growing up, did you ever have any like issues? Because I feel like you and I may come from a background that's similar in terms of privilege, but that that's as far as the similarities may go. Um, I, I never even considered that you, you may have had a harder time growing up in a handful of situations that I didn't even like recognize. Um, did did, would you say that growing up in the South was particularly uh, difficult or that you had moments when like you would probably like feel um, uh, that it would be difficult for you that I probably didn't even pick up on or like, you know, subtleties that I didn't even I wasn't even aware of? Um, what what was your take on that? Like high school, middle school, all in South Carolina? Yeah, you know, interesting. Um, you know, I think you and I, it just shows you like, yo. Um, well, first, I think everybody should have uh, a friend that's a cool white boy that, you know, takes you mud riding and exposes you uh, to this stuff that black people usually don't do. Um, but I think you and I at a very like young age, um, without even talking about it way too much, you and I kind of knew like, yo, race, race might be a toxic social construct. Um, and we both share a genetic history. Um, and I know those things could be like, could look fundamentally opposed or whatever, but uh, our friendship, we were never binded by scientific racism that has trapped, I think, a lot of people and created a lot of these um, cultural wars that are going on here. Um, I think um, I gravitated and I experienced a lot of racism in South Carolina. Uh, of course, but I've, you know, experienced racism in lots of places in ways that were small or uh, major. Um, but I've also experienced a lot of um, incredible uh, positive moments from uh, people of all, all races. And I think the thing is, there's going to be bad apples in every single group, you know. Uh, but I think I, I my philosophy and, and take on it and the way I see the world is that the majority of people are actually good, decent people. Um, you know, there's there's just some bad apples in every single um, domain, um, in every single background. Uh, but you know, if you if you if you study history and you and you take a look back and you take a look at this um, ancestral diversity that stretches back for thousands of years, um, you start to realize that, like, you know, despite the superficial 
physical differences, you'll notice how much we have in common. And I think you and I at like, you know, 14, 15, we had a tremendous amount in common. Um, and I think, I think it's MLK that says, um, an eye for an eye leaves, um, everybody blind or something like that. Um, but, and I I think everyone now is going to see like, Hey, a white person and a black person can mess up a quote from MLK. Um, but I, um, but you know, I don't know. I think, um, I don't know. I think, I think, um, I just didn't let a, f- uh, a few unfortunate encounters with racism, uh, shape my entire perspective about all of the people that I would meet, uh, in my future. So it's been, I think, incredible, uh, meeting you at a very young age because you exposed me to a lot of ideas, um, and, th- and you taught me a lot of stuff about like white culture um, and just like what it's like to be a white dude in this world and vice versa. So we both just kind of like always have been like a sponge uh, to each other. Oh yeah. And I, like, man, I just remember you took me out in DC, you know, and like I got exposed to a very, uh, a, a, an experience going out that like, I, I mean, it wasn't like a crazy experience, but it was just like not, not what I like. I mean, I don't know. I, I guess I don't go out much, but but I just I remember valuing it a lot because I was just like, this is this is it's so cool to be a part of this because like it's not something that like I I gravitate towards. You know, it's like it's so cool to be like in a in a different like from my natural like you know group that I would naturally gravitate to just because of like social dynamics or whatever it is. And like I I just value that so much and like I, I appreciate it and like. It, it's, it's been amazing just to be able to be exposed. You know, it's like, I, I think that that exposure is just essential for like, you know, overcoming like these, you know, concepts that are, you know, like people like overcoming racism is, you know, you do it just as a hands-on activity and it's by participating and like sharing culture and like, you know, mixing people. And I, I think it's been a blessing our friendship it really it really has allowed a lot of you know expansion of our, our like i think both of our concepts and 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 i value it so much um and i i guess i one more thing before we end i think that we could probably have a part two and a, give this video a like if you want to hear the part two of this video um and like it on spot you know, spotify apple uh, and uh, google podcasts if you want to hear a second part we we definitely are just just now getting started with our formula, with our concept of what this video is about. But I want to touch on something because I think that you would be able to provide some insight that I like. I was kind of uh, about two years ago when the Black Life Matters thing started. I found myself in some very um, uncomfortable conversations on Facebook with my you know white uh, white friends from high school that you know didn't come from uh wealth that were you know kind of uh probably under under the poverty line um and you know th- this discussion that i had with some of these people was like what what's this white privilege that you're talking about and you know like this is this is a uh, completely um you know it's it's such a uh, subjective topic but i do think that there's different t- kinds of privilege and like you know, one of them is definitely the color of your skin, but another one is just like the, you know, your, your background, your, you, where you come from, like what, what's your economic situation? What's your socioeconomic status? And that's pretty multifaceted. Um, did you ever find yourself in situations where you felt like, uh, your privilege, um, like assume, like I, I'm not like an expert on your situation, but assuming that you were able to avoid, um, situations uh, that, you know, black people might normally confront just because you had more privilege in the economic sense than like, um, most, most people in our, you know, high school. Yeah. Um, interesting point. And I think that's like a whole nother episode for sure. And, um, cause you know, people say racism and classism are cousins. And I think you and I could do we could have a whole nother hour, a few hour hours of conversation just about classism. Um, but I think like the bottom line is, and and that's why I think there's so many different opinions about this because there's so many, uh, 
black people and white people and and everyone who lives in America uh, who is having a different who's who are having different experiences. Um, but I think what what I like to look at is just kind of like history a long time ago. And I think what we've what we've seen, what historians have told us and shown us is that during the throughout the 18th, 19th and 20th, 20th centuries, um, there's been a lot of energy um, placed into dividing the human species into separate categories. Um, and I think right now, more and more people in the 21st century are seeing like, hey, uh, if you look at DNA and genetic analysis, um, these categories are, uh, are, not, are, are, are not meaningful. Um, they're very meaningless categories. And all of us have been very connected uh, all along. So, um, okay. Okay. But the, the poverty and the classism is like, you know, a a whole separate, uh, conversation that is also very important on its own. Well, I would love to, I would love to have that conversation. And yeah, it's, it's kind of unfair to just like, uh, untap that can of worms, uh, at the very end of the conversation. So make sure if you, if you're listening up until this point, please, let us know in the comments if you'd like to hear our perspective on the uh, on uh, classism, which or classism privilege, uh, you know, like the different ways in which you can be uh, aggregated as a community. I think that that's something that we could we could probably offer a lot of interesting perspectives on. Um, but uh, yeah, man, I, uh, I I I I I think that this is just. Uh, it, it, I think it's. I think that we sh- we could we we should think of naming our podcast. Um, restorative justice <laughs> just because I love the idea of just like we don't know like it's like we're working for a solution you know it's like I, I like uh, the, the idea that I like behind restorative justice is like no like you can improve and it's not like saying that like things have to stay this way like I don't know like, it sounds really poetic to me but um, I don't know we'll have to discuss that yeah hey um, like always man uh, this is this was a great um, great catching up with you I think you know, we're just probably just skimming the surface here about the race and climate um, and everything that's going on with cancel culture in our country. Um, But hopefully things get better. Um, I am optimistic uh, that things will get better. Um, And I I also think that maybe this situation in in Ukraine um, can help unify the people in America. And maybe we can all start to recognize that, hey, um, we need to do everything possible uh, to protect our democracy and find ways of um, eliminating all of these uh, cultural cultural wars that are going on here. I, I think that now is really the time for us to, uh, you know, like it's a shame that you need a war to bring a country together. But I think it, it's, it's definitely something that it's time for us to stop being so divided and you know, I think we can all agree as a, you know, society and internationally, international community that Russia is really, really doing horrible things out there and that, you know, we can, uh, like, there's so much power to be made and like being open to, you know, not only forgiving, but also progressing. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I appreciate, uh, your time, Oz, and, I um I appreciate all our uh, listeners and um I think I think we'd probably sign off. I think we made some some good points, but yeah, I, I, I'm excited to see where this takes us and excited to see where um, how far this goes. Um, hopefully, we can get on Spotify in the next couple of weeks and just start to um, uh, look for solutions and contemplate problems. Uh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, man. I think we said um, a few good things about forgiveness and reconciliation, uh, kind of like being the foundation of a vibrant social movement and a healthy democracy. Um, this is a amazing way to start off a Saturday morning. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the weekend, bro. And I can't wait uh, to catch up with you next week, man.